Welcome back into the Original Gangsters podcast. I am your co-host, Scott Bernstein, along with my partner in crime and co-conspirator, the doctor, Jimmy Bucciolato. Hi, everyone. Hey, now. Just want to remind everyone, please subscribe to our new video channel on YouTube at Gangster Podcast. And please follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Like us. Please spread the word. Thank you. This week, we are going to deep dive the uh, gangster backstory of Sean Puff Daddy Combs. Um, there is a, a, a narrative there that has been discussed, and I think the, the surface has been scratched. People that n know the history of Puffy uh, know that his father was a drug dealer who was slain in Harlem in the 1970s. But beyond that, I don't think that story's ever really been colored up. Um, Puffy Combs, you know, the, the quintessential hip-hop mogul, empresario, uh, such a game changer in so many different phases of life. Uh, was was the the pioneer for mainstream music going from pop to rap and you know hip hop that you know stays with us today. He started it you know twenty five years ago. Uh, fashion, just pop culture celebrity, uh, someone that at his peak could really tap anyone he wanted to become a star. Uh, you saw it with Jodeci, Mary J. Blige, Notorious B.I.G., Mace. Um, just was very transformative. Uh, we've discussed in the past on this show about Puffy's ties to modern day organized crime. Uh, we can go into that a little bit as well. Uh, Black Mafia family, Big Meech and those guys were pretty integral in the rise of Bad Boy Records. Uh, again, something that I don't think a lot of people knew until we, uh, exposed it. Um, and we, we actually had a, a IRS agent on who without confirming it told us for all intents and purposes that the IRS had heard that that bad boy records was was started with a uh investment from Big Meech and the Black Mafia family um but let's go back to the 1970s to the superfly uh era the Harlem drug trade people that that you know study the underworld or or people that are just you know familiar with it from a pop culture standpoint, watching movies. I'm sure they know all about Frank Lucas, the main character in American Gangster, Nicky Barnes, Mr. Untouchable, uh, who was, you know, probably the most well-known and iconic Afri African-American drug boss of the 1970s. But before the rise of Lucas and Barnes, there was a drug kingpin that ran Harlem who they called Jesus Christ. <laughs> Great nickname. It reminds me of uh, the movie uh, In Too Deep with uh, Omar Epps and LL Cool J, where LL Cool J was playing a drug boss named God. And uh, God was actually another. It was a true story. The, the movie In Too Deep, they, they, uh, the storyline takes place in Cincinnati, but in real life, uh, God was a, a drug dealer in Boston. But uh, when was that movie? I don't even remember. In Too Deep came out, I think, in '99 or 2000. Was that a good soundtrack? Uh, I loved it. Jermaine Dupri, uh, Stanley Tucci was in it. Uh, Neil Long was in it. Omar Epps plays the undercover um, cop. I'm look up the soundtrack that, that infiltrates the uh, LL Cool J's drug operation. And again, it was based on a true story out of Boston. They just changed the. Uh, storyline to, to Cincinnati for the, for the film. A lot of those movies had really good soundtracks back then because they would have like exclusive tracks that weren't yeah. on, some of them at least, weren't right. on like the standard release. I think Jermaine Dupri did the soundtrack. And then Jermaine Dupri's in the film. That's cool. So uh, Jesus Christ was the biggest <laughs> uh, drug lord in Harlem uh, from the time Bumpy Johnson died in 1968-69 until about 1973 when uh, the Jesus Christ, whose real name was Willie Abraham. A lot of people just called him JC, but JC was short for Jesus Christ. And uh, he ran Harlem uh, for about three, four years. And his top lieutenant or one of his top lieutenants was Pretty Melvin Combs. And Pretty Melvin was Puff Daddy's father. And he was a pretty big deal. I didn't realize that. I thought that uh, he was a minor league player that 
got killed in, you know, a drug deal gone bad. Uh, I, I didn't realize the impact or imprint that he had made in the years before. I didn't realize who he was running with and the magnitude of the, the organization that he was running with and how high he had climbed in that organization, which was based out of a, um, a bar and nightclub in Harlem called the Gold Tavern or the Gold, sorry, the Gold Lounge, which was owned by Willie Abraham. Yeah. I mean, the, I always was under the impression that his father was associated with some Harlem drug dealers, but as you've pointed out you know, in private conversations in the 1970s, that's not saying much. I mean, who, <laughs> who wasn't a drug who dealer in Harlem right, in the 1970s? Or at least associated with yeah. or like connected to somehow. So that I didn't necessarily appreciate that he actually was pushing a lot of weight and he was a significant dude. Yeah. He wasn't just some um, low life street figure that uh, dabbled in uh, dime bags and right. hand, and to hand uh, uh, transactions. This was a guy that was moving major weight for a major, major player and was also that drug dealer, meaning Willie Abraham, a pretty, a pretty Melvin Combs acted as Abraham's go between for both Frank Lucas and Nikki Barnes in the early days of both of their respective organizations. And there's actually an interesting um, part of the um, Mr. Untouchable documentary where I think it's in the, I think it's in the special features. It's either the Mr. Untouchable documentary or the um, bonus features on the American gangster DVD. But there was a, a phone conversation between Nikki Barnes and Frank Lucas discussing the, you know, their ascent in certain entertainment circles and how, you know, they had, they were just known in Harlem at a certain point and now they were known around, you know, around the world because of the movies and the, 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 the rap songs and whatnot. And in that conversation, which took place in the mid two thousands, which was relatively early on in, in Puff. I mean, Puffy was a big deal. I mean, a really big deal at that point, but uh, it was still 15, 20 years ago. And I forgot which one of them brings it up, but either Nikki or, uh, Frank Lucas says, Hey, yeah, you know, you, you see Puffy Combs on all these music videos and on all these red carpets. Like, yeah, remember Melvin? And they're both were like, Oh, yeah, Melvin was a great guy. And um, they start talking about uh, Puffy's dad, which maybe was the first inclination for me that, that uh, Melvin Combs was uh, bigger than a, a small deal. I've Mr. Untouchable documentary. I don't think I've ever seen that. Is that, yes, yeah, it's, it's from uh, the uh, Rockefeller group. Uh, oh, Dame Dash and Jay Z. I'll have to check that out. Came out in the late 2000s. I mean, I've say. seen the um, American Gangsters episode from BET. Yeah, on, on all the on Mr. Untouchable. That's one of the best documentary series. Yeah, in my opinion, by the way. But um, I'm gonna have to look that up. But I have the, I have. I'm such a nerd. I have the American Gangster film DVD, like triple disc set, which yeah. has all the so do <laughs> all I. bonus footage. And uh, on on an aside, uh, I'm a giant giant jay-z fan and uh i think his american gangster inspired uh record called american gangster which is not an official soundtrack to the film but is kind of a companion piece uh i think you know for me that could be my maybe second or third favorite uh jay-z album i i just i love all the songs on uh, on his american gangster record but I digress. Uh, so let's just give a little bit you know, of... I can't give props to Jay-Z because I'm Tupac guy. <laughs> He's, you're too West Coast. <laughs> I'm still holding the... I mean, <laughs> Tupac is my all-time favorite. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But, uh, you know, I, I put Jay-Z in that Tupac and Biggie category. No, Jay-Z, he's dope. He's good. I mean, I, I don't I don't love East Coast hip-hop as much as I do West Coast, but he's obviously... And to me, Jay-Z, Jay-Z was an acquired taste for me. I mean, when, when Jay-Z first came out, I did not like him. Yeah. I thought his style was... His his rapping style was a little bit awkward to me, but he made that rapping style mainstream. It's not awkward anymore. No, I like I like I of all those guys, I probably well, I like Nas a lot, but and I I love Wu Tang, but I I don't really consider Wu Tang in that same. They yeah, weren't like gangster. Different. They were a little different, but you know I I'm a Death Row Records guy. So Pretty Melvin Combs got arrested in November of 1971 with. 
uh, five pounds of uncut China white heroin and $50,000 in cash. And in the subsequent weeks and months before he was murdered, there were a series of federal raids and arrests and um, traffic stops where people were getting caught with dope and businesses were being raided, apartments were being raided. And the belief of the Abraham organization was that Melvin Combs had flipped and turned government informant. I know Puffy has been pretty adamant when he discusses it, saying that that was not the case, that his dad just was murdered in a drug deal gone wrong. Uh, but everything that I've heard in documents I've read, uh, people that I've talked to that, that worked these cases in the 70s, and we're, gonna, we're about to speak to one, uh, D, DEA founding father, Frank Panessa, who we're about to jump on a call with and discuss his, his uh, employment working undercover in the Harlem drug trade of the 1970s. And he specifically worked pretty Melvin Combs and, and Willie Abraham. But uh, he, he was murdered. Melvin Combs was murdered in February of, or sorry, January 26th, 1972. It was about two months after he was arrested. Uh, I don't know for sure if that arrest was made public or not, but in the months after pretty Melvin Combs was killed, uh, the entire Abraham organization was indicted and went down. And also it's in your reporting, if you want to, we could ask Frank about it, but it's just kind of interesting to just throw out there now that not only was Combs interacting with Barnes and Lucas who were big timers, but he was, he was interacting with some Italian guys, some, some Cosa Nostra guys, some guys that maybe at the time were not major players, right. but would become major players. One of them being Benji Castellazzo, who is right now under indictment for being the underboss of the Colombo crime family. Yeah. Uh, Benji the Claw. And then you had uh, Alphonse uh, Funzi Siska, who I believe was a, is a Gambino or was a Gambino capo that ran New Jersey. Uh, so, yeah, he was, again, running in some a pretty fast crowd in terms of underworld figures, pretty Melvin Combs was. And if you, you know, look at the picture of him that's online, there's a couple photos of him online. Very good looking, uh, very dapper, very uh, fastidious in his appearance. And, you know, echoes what his son would, would become, the reputation his son would build. And, and we should tell everyone that uh, Puffy was not yet three years old when his dad was murdered. So he was two and a half. Uh, I question, you know, what true memories he, he would have had at that age of, of Pretty Melvin. Yeah, it's a tragic. I mean, whatever his dad was doing, it's still tragic for a son to grow up without yeah. a father like that. But And Melvin was killed uh, in Central Park. He was supposedly meeting someone um, on a corner around Central Park in, in Manhattan uh, for what he thought was going to be a drug deal, and someone came up to his car and unloaded their clip. It reminds me of um, the uh, his his old man interacting with, with, you know, dealing with the Italians. It reminds me of um, Carlito. Yeah. I run with Pleasant Avenue. Made, made guys. guys. Connected guys. <laughs> that's, that's my favorite scene. The Pleasant in the home, Avenue crew. The go snatch a purse. Yeah. Who do you run with? <laughs> he says, go snatch a purse. Yeah, go snatch a purse. <laughs> right. Uh, but, you know, I think that's another thing to, to point out before we bring on Frank Panessa. And this is something we've, we've discussed, but it, it, it merits bringing up again, is that in the 1970s, really in the drug trade across the country, but Harlem might have been, you know, one of the epicenters of that. Having an Italian supply line was a status symbol. Yes. You know, it was something that showed, it was the same thing as buying a Mercedes or, or having a, a, a diamond pinky ring or, you know, renting out uh, the Apollo for a night or renting out a, a club for the night like they did. I mean, it, these guys live large and part of that was showing off who their gangland associates were. And if you could say like with, with uh, Nicky Barnes, I mean, he was famously connected to Maddie Madonna, yeah. who, just like we just said a second ago, was a guy that wasn't a big deal when 
Barnes was hooked up with him in the 70s, but would become a really big deal, would become the boss of the Lucchese crime family. Yeah, there's a currency. Um, I mean, I was even reading in Misha Glennie's book, McMafia. It's a great book. Uh, probably 10, 15 years old now. But even in Europe, he was talking about the Eastern European gangsters, uh, Russians and whatever. Some of them deal with the uh, Camorra and the Andragata and um, Cosa Nostra. And even now, they, they, there's a currency that, like, you have a little bit more status if you're an Eastern European gangster saying that you're connected. So, and, and a lot of it is just the mystique, going yeah. back to the Godfather films and, you know. And for any novices that are listening to us that subscribe to the belief that's been perpetrated in a lot of television and film and even, you know, interviews with real-life mobsters that the mob was somehow anti-drugs or uh, opposed to narcotics trafficking. It, it, it's the exact opposite. They, they might have given that lip service to, you know, throw the, throw the cops off the scent. But in reality, the, the American mafia was built on the shoulders of, of major narcotics traffickers. Yeah, I think we, we actually talked about this in the Lucchese episode we dropped a few weeks ago that, yeah, there, there are definitely Italian mafia guys that, that prefer to stay out of junk, as, but it's an individual decision. And it has it's, nothing to do with morals or right. ethics, the way they make it seem like in the movie The Godfather. No, and, um, and, and all these like, guys that are getting involved in drugs, make no mistake, they're passing envelopes up the, up the yeah. chain to the same guys who, who are saying, we don't want our guys dealing in junk. They don't turn away any of those envelopes. Well, just you know, three examples I'll throw out, and then we'll, we'll uh, transition and bring Frank Panessa on. And I know this is a, another a bit of a side, but Jack Tocco, the, the longtime Detroit Mafia boss, Paul Castellano, uh, the longtime, or not that long, but ran the Gambino family for 10 years, and Angelo Bruno, who ran the Philadelphia Mafia for 20 years. All three of these guys were pretty loud proponents of that narrative of, uh, you know, we, we don't deal drugs and, right. that, and that's beneath us. Yeah. And all three of those guys we know were taking giant sums of money from their lieutenants that were narcotics traffickers. Yeah. I mean, with, with Bruno, um, it was Long John Martirano. Yeah. With, with Jack Tocco, it was Jimmy Quasarano. He loved Martirano because he was a big earner. Yeah. Drugs you make <laughs> And Jimmy, make Qua money. there was no one closer to Jack Tocco in an advisory capacity oh, yeah. than yeah. Jimmy Q. I mean, Jimmy Q was his yeah. conciliary so, when he first became boss, then he went to prison and then was kind of his de facto conciliary until uh, the early 2000s when he died. And Jimmy Q was a global yeah. heroin trap, not just a right. transnational. <laughs> he was a major, yeah. I mean, uh, indicted in Italy, you know. They couldn't, they couldn't, they tried him in, a, in a, what do you call it, absentia? Absentia, yeah. And he was convicted, but the, obviously the U.S. wouldn't wouldn't deport him. So, yeah, I mean, he wasn't just some, there's no way that the leadership did not know that. Right. <laughs> so it's, uh, you know, it's just something that you should be aware of if you pay attention to this stuff. And, you know, we, we, we always try to draw the line between fact and fiction and, and mythology and reality. So we're lucky to have a living legend calling in right now. Uh, his name is Frank Panessa. He is the founding father of the Drug Enforcement Agency. He was agent number one. And this guy, uh, some people have lived a movie script, um, but Frank has lived 10. And Frank, uh, thank you for coming on and joining us to give us some insight on your work uh, with the uh, Federal Bureau of Narcotics and the DEA into the Harlem drug trade. Yes, good to be here. And I just want to say that Frank Panessa is an American patriot. He is an American hero. This man spent 30 plus years putting his life on the line, infiltrating different criminal organizations. He, he infiltrated all five of the New York Mafia families. Uh, he infiltrated the Harlem drug trade. He inf infiltrated the outlaw biker circle, uh, the cocaine cowboys down in Miami. He was uh, sent to Rome in the late 80s, early 90s as the official uh, attache for the DEA uh, to work the big... Buschetta. Uh, the Tomas Thomas Buschetta, Buschetta. Uh, the Maxim trials. And then he, at the end of his career, he ran the DEA office in Philadelphia. His signature case... Um, He's got so many of them, but his probably the signature of all the signatures is the Pizza Connection case, biggest drug bust in American history, where you had uh, Sicilian and American mafiosi uh, transporting, smuggling, 
heroin from Sicily to the East Coast of the United States in pizza sauce jars. And Frank broke that whole thing open and took down that entire network. So, Frank, uh, thank you for your service, and thank you for joining us. Thank you. So thank let's, you. Let's just dive in. So uh, I think, you know, you had been working for a while, um, you know, in, the, in, in law enforcement in New York. But yeah. if I'm not mistaken, the, the Harlem drug gangs were, were some of, you know, your earliest um, groundbreaking work. Oh, yeah. Well, see, what had happened, we were working on the Italians in New York. We were working on uh, uh, Joseph and Charlie Di Palermo, Virgil Alisi, Ralph Patino. These were made guys that were doing heavy heroin. You know, it was a billion dollar a year heroin business. People didn't realize it. But through our surveillances, we saw that they were meeting blacks in Harlem. And so we figured, hey, I don't know if we're going to get into these guys, but let's start surveillance on all these these people that they're meeting. So we started doing cases on Nikki Barnes, James Lofton, Frank Lucas, Robert Stephanie, Goldfinger Terrell, Stephen Monsanto, Frank Matthews. These were all people that we spotted on surveillance. We used to go to a Smalls Paradise Lounge and sit outside. And those were the days when they had the big pimp mobiles, you know, the big uh, Cadillacs. Uh, and they had like the lights on the sides of the uh, of the roof. And, and they wore uh, uh, fur coats and fur hats. Superfly, uh, very ostentatious. Very ostentatious. Yeah, Superfly. And and you just uh, name dropped uh, Small's Paradise. Uh, that was Frank Lucas's uh, bar club, right? Yes. Yeah. They reference it and in the movie. They reference say, it in we the movie. All, we were seeing all these people. We we were getting information that they were heavy into heroin. Uh, uh, we put a wiretap on Goldfinger at his house in the Bronx. So yeah, Frank, and, and Frank, we had a number of wiretaps, and and we found that Jesus, these people are doing heavy heroin. Hey, Frank, back up one sec. Let's let's let people know. Um, so Frank Lucas, Nikki Barnes are the two names that we uh, talked about before you came on. Um, I see. But Willie Goldfinger Terrell was another very compelling underworld figure from that era, just based on the nickname and the reputation of being fond of gold in every way, shape, and form. Uh, yeah. Everything and that he fond had. fond of shoes. Right. Everything was gold-plated. Uh, <laughs> and uh, that was one of your big early collars. Yeah. I remember putting the cuffs on him and, and uh, saying to him, oh, I'm going to get these gold-plated. <laughs> <laughs> That's something straight out of, a, yeah. out of a television show or movie. And when we, when we make Frank's television show, television show or, or film, we are definitely going to put yeah. that in there. Um, but do you have any recollections of pretty Melvin Combs, which is kind of the basis of this episode? Oh yeah. No, I mean, uh, Melvin Combs was on our watch list too, you know, but as I say, uh, all the different groups in the task force, uh, were working on, you know, different individuals, uh, like, um, uh, uh, I, I was on the wiretap on Goldfinger, and I worked on uh, uh, James Lofton up in New Rochelle. And uh, Robert Stephanie at the time was living in Jersey, but he was always coming into uh, coming into the city. And and we watched them at as as we, I said, Small's Paradise, and there were a number of other clubs that they hung out in, you know. And uh, we we took down a lot of people getting information uh, and what they were doing. They were selling, so like you take people like Frank Lewick, Lucas, they were selling so much heroin that what they would do on a Friday night, they round up about 10 to 15 women and bring them to an apartment house. And all the women would have to strip naked and they'd work all weekend. They couldn't leave the apartment and they bagged all the heroin. They bagged all the nickel bags. And, uh, and with, you know, by, Frank, by the end of the weekend, there were thousands of nickel bags and uh, they were paid good money to do that. 
But then the next month, they wouldn't go to the same apartment. They'd get another apartment and do the same thing. When when they use the um the neighborhood junkies as like test dummies or like uh, <laughs> like guinea pigs, where they would uh, let oh, them yeah. try yeah, it, what they would do, and some of these guys would OD on it, and they'd be like, "All right, we got to cut it a little bit more." Yeah, no, well, the infamous person that always did that was, of course, uh, Lillo Galenti. He was a ruthless bastard, but that Italian mafia uh, boss. He would, they yeah, they would. Uh, he was head of the Bonanno. Uh, crime family, uh, and uh, when a shipment came in, they would grab a junkie and uh, uh, give him a needle with, you know, whatever was in in the in the kilo that came in. And like, if he died within a minute, they said, "Oh, this is good stuff." Jeez, they didn't care. Some ruthless uh, individuals, and that's what they did. Well, even with even with the junkies, it, you you take people like Lucas and 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 all those people. If they thought somebody was ratting on them or the person was an informant, they'd give them a hot shot. You know, where they die instantly. They'd give them pure heroin. A hot because dose. you have to remember, in those days, heroin was really cut. I mean, we were talking about heroin only like. 15% pure on the street back in those days. Most of it was, we used to say that people were getting a sugar high because they cut it with manite and they cut it with quinine and things like that. And uh, now today, I, I think it comes out, God knows. Well, now it's fentanyl. Now it's laced with fentanyl. And now with is, fentanyl, you yeah. die from it. But right. uh, back then it was quinine and manite. Manite was like uh, uh uh, a, a thing used uh, uh, for for little kids uh, uh, for diarrhea and things right. like that. Do you remember? Do you remember, like, at some point in the '90s or 2000s, when Puffy Combs was becoming, you know, iconic and was on, you know, everyone's television screens and on the cover of oh, yeah. all those magazines? Well, do you remember you know, saying to yourself, like, "Yeah, I work this guy's dad." Yeah, he, he uh, uh, of course, he was Melvin Combs' son, and uh, 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 he, he, he made reference to it quite a bit, that he was proud of his father and, and things like that. Do you have any, I know this has been a long time, and we're talking 50 years ago, but yeah. do you have any recollection of when uh, Melvin popped up dead in uh, January of 72? Oh, gee, I'm trying to remember offhand. I, 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 you know, I, I recall, and yet I, I can't come out with it right now. I, I just can't think about it. But I remember it happening because we were very much on them. We were working with uh, the head of uh, New York Narcotics, who was a Sterling Johnson, a great prosecutor, you know, and he would he would do anything for us. We we would go into him, you know. Uh, 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 for search warrants and arrest warrants. And, and he was an unbelievable uh, prosecutor. He was New York state prosecutor on narcotics. So that organization that he belonged to ended up tumbling in the months after his murder. So yeah, you guys were, you guys were building a case against the Willie Abraham uh, group. Yeah. But then of course uh, the other people took it up. Right? Oh Yeah. So well, we were, hours. right. We were saying that uh, before you got on that uh, Melvin Combs's rise, if you will, happen, you know, in the uh, infancy of Lucas and Barnes. Uh, Lucas and Barnes became a really big deal in 73, 74, 75. Yeah. And Willie Abraham was kind of the precursor to those guys who had taken things over from Bumpy Johnson in the late 60s. And that was yeah. who pretty Melvin Combs was working for out of this Harlem um, uh, night spot called the Gold's Lounge. Yes, Gold's Lounge. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, hey, Frank, would you say that up until that point, um, Abrams was, is it Abrams? Or Abra Abraham. 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 Was he 100% supplied by the Italians at that point, or, or did he have any of those direct sources to Asia? Well, I, originally it was all the Italians that were supplying them, you know. But then when we started taking down the Italians, 
they reached out to Asia, and that's when they were sneaking in the heroin uh, uh, in, uh, in, in caskets of soldiers and things like that. And uh, furniture coming in with soldiers, uh, you know, moving from overseas from Southeast Asia. Uh, I know we had one case where the heroin was in a refrigerator and, and, and things like that. But no, originally it was the Italians that they were they were dealing with. With, the, with I the... had a few people. Uh, I had uh, one guy, uh, Frank Townsend, who we arrested. And uh, he would never give me the Italians. He'd give me every other black violator, but he wouldn't give up the Italians. They they were true blue to them, you know. Well, I think they were That's afraid of them too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and they were afraid of them. Uh, so with with the uh, the Melvin Combs connection, uh, we have ties to both the Gambinos and the Columbos. I want to throw out two names and see if uh, if there's any name recognition for you. So the one guy that uh, that Melvin Combs was dealing with that went on to, you know, rise to meteor, meteoric heights more recently was a guy named uh, Ben or Benjamin Castellazzo. They called him the Claw. No, Castellazzo, that doesn't ring a bell with me. And then the other one was Alphonse Siska, who they called Funzi. Oh, Alphonse Siska, we, yeah. I worked on. Yeah. So tell us a little bit oh, about Oh, yeah, Funzi. he was big. Yeah. He was big. And and they were also involved uh, with other people like uh, 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 Beansy Della Cava, uh, Tony Pichotta, uh Falsiglia. They were all part of that crew that was distributing. Larry, it. Larry the Nose? Larry the Nose, uh, Iarasi. I, I was on the arrest of Larry the Nose um, in the Bronx. It, it was... You look at the outside of the house, and it was just, you know, regular-looking house. You go inside, and it was like the Taj Mahal. I swear to God. I, you there? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, we. I I used to refer to it. I, I shouldn't say this as uh, early American Guinea. I mean the <laughs> the uh, <laughs> the furniture was gross. Frank and I can Bro. say that. Yeah. Scott, yeah. <laughs> Ben, and Frank can say that. We're Italiano, <clears throat> but uh, and of course, it all had plastic covering on it. Of course, <laughs> yeah, that's like that's was, old school. It was unbelievable, and we found heroin in the house, and we arrested his son. Uh, Larry, Larry wasn't home when we hit, and eventually we got him. But uh, when we did a search warrant on the house. Uh, we found heroin in, uh, in 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 one of the ceilings, it's, it's and we arrested his son. Frank, it's interesting to note about the way that the criminal justice system evolved, and you look at some of these busts that were taken. In, and I'm interested. I'm going to lay something out, and then I want to get your your input on it. So, in the '70s and early '80s, compared to what the laws became in the late eighties and nineties, they were somewhat lenient. These guys would take big drug busts and do less than 10 years in prison, yeah. um, as opposed to a lot of the, the crack cocaine inspired legislation where you could be caught for the first time with a, uh, what, what's, what was considered a, um, a, a sellable or saleable amount of powder and you're your first time you got caught with one kilo and this is it. You're done the rest of your life, uh, life in yeah. prison without parole, as opposed yeah. to some of these major violators for the, like, let's say the first 10, 15 years of the drug war that were getting for, you know, in comparison, they were getting slaps on the wrist. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, when they did away with the uh, uh, the mandatory minimum sentences, that, that was a travesty of justice because they knew in the old days, going back, you know, to the 60s, if you were caught the first time, mandatory five years. You got caught with weight the second time, mandatory 10 years, you know. But they did away with those things. And uh, there were people that I, uh, that I arrest, you know, especially – Italians, uh, you know, and in, in, uh, like like Pichotta, uh, 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 Anthony Pichotta and his brother Nicholas, uh, 
And I, and I believe their, one of their sons ended up becoming a capo in the Bananos, and I think he flipped. Nicholas Pashota Jr., who they called PJ, I think. Yeah, yeah, it was Nicholas Pashota Jr. Anthony Pashota was arrested in 59. He got out like in, uh, uh, no, he was arrested in 49. He got out in around 59. He was arrested again in 59 and got out, and I arrested him in 69. All, all for heroin, all the cases. It's, uh, I think it's a business that's difficult to walk away from. There's just so much money and limited, oh, li- limited effort and a lot of money on, on, you know, a lot of ROI, a lot of return on your investment, except, you know, the, <laughs> the, the, the opposite side of this, you know, the, the, uh, what do they call it? The, uh, the sword, um, cuts both ways or I don't know what expression I'm looking for, but you know, the, the other fact that might be quick money, but it's also double edged sword, double edged sword. That's what I was looking <laughs> at. Uh, <laughs> that, uh, you know, those, those, um, punishments can be quite yeah. severe for that little amount of work. You know how, yeah, well, let's face it. You invest a hundred thousand dollars and your return is over a million dollars. If you go down to the nickel bag, you know, I mean, uh, it's it's unbelievable the amount of money. Just look at the movie uh, Goodfellas and just uh, think about the scene when when Henry Hill comes home, uh, and in a matter of a day or two, they're back up on their feet and running. And he walks in the the, the door and says, "All right, pack up your stuff. We're, we're getting the hell out of this shithole apartment." I gotta go yeah. to Pit. I gotta go to Pittsburgh. I got some things uh, in the hopper, and then you know, within a couple of weeks, he's going uh, meeting up with uh, De Niro and Pesci, and they got garbage bags full of cash. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I mean, if you if you if you think about it, if you're a mafia guy and, and you're involved in construction, or or you have a big sports book or something, you you have the luxury of saying, "I don't want to get involved in junk." But if you're a street guy, an associate, or, or soldato, and like. Yeah, you know, it, it's a lot less labor intensive <laughs> to make a score a big drug deal. And with conspira- <laughs> and with conspiracy laws, as you know, that have been, uh, you know, weaponized. Uh, yeah, you know, definitely yeah, well, starting in the eighties. You don't have to touch the drugs. Rico, that, that's right. Yeah. You know when they right. when they came in with the RICO laws, uh, that really got a lot of them because then you were grabbing them all for conspiracy. And then there's this other. I'm interested to, to uh, throw this out at you and get your input on this too. Um, something that I find, it just blows my mind that there are professional criminals that just can't wrap their brain around certain basic fundamentals of law enforcement, such as, forget about not touching drugs for a second. When you get caught with large sums of cash, there are so many people that their initial, their impulse is, well, I didn't do anything wrong. I could have just found this cash in the you know, yeah, they can't true. prove that I've this cash was was, uh, you know, was was brought to me illegally. Um, but what they don't realize is the law doesn't make them have to prove it. The law from, you know, the start of any money laundering case is, you know, the the, the burden is on you to show that it did not come from somewhere illegally. If, if it's more than ten thousand dollars and you haven't reported it, the assumption by the government is that it came from somewhere illegal unless you show us otherwise. Yeah. So there's a lot of people that didn't that didn't understand getting caught with large sums of money, how that was basically the same thing as getting caught with large sums of drugs. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Did you notice that though? In some and some oh, yeah. offen- no, some I offenders did. had a hard time understanding what you know the basics of conspiracy, and they would oh definitely, definitely, and they would argue with you and, and say, well, you know, I uh, I never touched drugs in my life, and it's like, well, that's not the point. The point is you have three people working for you that did, and then you were benefiting from that work. That's true. Uh, and, you know, they were all profiting by, it. you know, uh, uh, when when all the uh, uh, mafia bosses says, no, stay away from narcotics, they were all getting a package every month. Mm-hmm. You know, they were all uh, making money from it. They were talking out of both sides of their mouth. You know, uh, uh, dealing with them all those years, uh, dealing with the, uh, with the Gambinos and dealing, of course, with the Sicilian faction of the uh, Bonanno family. Um, 
Well, the Bonanos made no uh, bones about it. They were in the heroin business, yeah. and everybody knew it, especially when Lilo Galante got out of jail. Uh, uh, he took complete control of all heroin uh, coming into the United States. And uh, again, all, all these all these violators that we worked on a billion dollars a year. People can't people can't imagine that. You know what I'm saying? They just can't imagine. Like me, I'm, I'm involved in a, in a Sicilian cell that's bringing in a million dollars a day. That you know, that's uh, over three hundred million dollars a year, more than a lot of Fortune 500 companies make. And yet, uh, uh, John Q. Public isn't aware of the magnitude of this. And now, look what the cartels are doing through Mexico. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that now, I it's, mean, now it's even it, it's surpassed what was going on in the seventies and eighties. But no, these cartels are bringing in thousands of kilos a week, thousands. I know. I mean, back then in the seventies, if we made a hundred kilo bus, boy, that was big news. Big news. Now they they seem to be getting that stuff daily, and thousands, hundreds of thousands of fentanyl pills and and things like that. You know, I, I'm, as I'm as we're talking and it's kind of percolating in my mind, I, I almost think that this lip service that a lot of these old school mafiosi would espouse these anti drug uh, edicts that were all bullshit. It, it almost makes me think that they were doing it for PR purposes. Yeah, like they were doing it so people like you, Frank Panessa, would see that quote in a newspaper or see that quote on a. Uh, and this is totally unrealistic thinking, but w that the DEA would see, you know, let's say Carlo Gambino or someone make a statement about being anti-drugs. And then the FBI or the DEA would just say, oh, well, Carlo Gambino said they were anti-drug. Let's close up shop, guys. Let's, let's leave them alone now. <laughs> I, I think it's for people in the neighborhood more. Yeah. I think it's for I think it's for to have insulation within the neighborhood so people don't talk because they think exactly. these are good guys. They're not into drugs or prostitution. Like, yeah. you know, these are just and, and gambling. And, of course, uh, you know. numbers was legal to them, even to all the people that <laughs> right. lived in the neighborhoods. Yeah. But there was a lot of dovetailing with the numbers business and the drug business. I mean. Oh, uh, yeah. Like uh, uh, Spanish. That's how they met all right. the black dudes. Right. Drug, right. drug guys. Well, Spanish Ray. Uh, who was the big Harlem numbers guy in the Hispanic communities. Um, I don't think he's ever necessarily been tied to drugs, but I know that there were a lot of guys in his orbit that were working with the Italians, that were working with the African-Americans. And from yeah. their work with the numbers, it then blossomed or yeah. evolved into, into narcotics. And I think it's, oh, yeah. Yeah. It, you mentioned the Bananos being you know brazen but i think the bananos and the genovese were really the first families uh, to just make no apologies for no, for dealing didn't. in drugs the other three families the colombo lucchese um well gambinos were big and gambinos guys. but i they weren't they weren't open about it paul castellano wanted to kill john gotti because uh, yeah, because they were doing the in. dope. Yeah, but he was related to the chair. Yeah, he was he a was big phony. I'm not saying that Paul Castellano <laughs> he's, wasn't a, he's hypocrite. a hypocrite. Yeah. I'm saying that. Yeah, he was, he was a hypocrite. He was getting money from everybody. Yeah, yeah. Della Croce was a I'm saying the Gambinos guy. in the 80s were still espousing this oh, yeah. anti-drug sure. message yeah. when the Bananos and the Genovese kind of said uh, that might have been okay for, for, the, for the first part of the, the century or whatever. But by the 60s... In, in the 70s, I don't think the Bananos or Genovese were, were uh, lying about what their intentions were. Yeah, I mean, the yeah. the Bananos— I mean, look at Vito Genovese, the the, the founding father yeah, he, of that. His was a not, drug bust. Was he, was he a original five family, Don? No, he, Luciano was. Okay, right. So uh, Vito Genovese died in prison— A drug bust. Of a drug bust, you know, for a drug bust. Yeah. yeah. He, and he, Luciano he himself, you know, was, was big into importing heroin. Yeah, at the, well, he was, and he was in. Uh, once he was in, Frank knows more about this, but once he was in Italy, he was a big exporter of, yeah. of heroin. Oh so, yeah. <laughs> so I'm just, I'm just mentioning those two crime families as kind of being ahead of the curve in terms of embracing drug dealing and and shedding the, oh, yeah. this false, fa this fallacy or this false narrative that they weren't involved. In. Oh, like yeah. you said, little Galante. Uh, like, like I, as I say, I worked on Anthony Pashota and he was in the Genovese family. Larry Arana, uh, Arasi was Genovese. Um, 
um, uh, the Kafora brothers. Kaf- Kava was Genevieve. The Kafora brothers. All people that I worked on. You the know? Kafora brothers. Yes. Yeah. Although John Romento was a big junk guy, and he yeah, was Lucchese. Lucchese. Yeah. So there were always. I think all. I'm not. The no, again, I'm not saying that. Uh, I, I think maybe um, what I'm saying is being uh, misunderstood. I'm not saying that all families weren't dealing in drugs. Yeah. I'm saying that the Genovese and the Bonanno families were the first groups to come forth and yeah. stop the pretense. With, stop the pretense. Yeah, of I, I saying understand. that we don't deal drugs. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. a good point. Yeah. Um, and let's also just we've talked about Lilo Galante a couple times on this podcast. Carmine Lilo Galante. The anniversary of his assassination was uh, yesterday or the day before. Yeah. Um, he was murdered in July of 1979. Uh, there's a famous photo of him lying, you know, dead, sprawled yeah, out cigar. on a, yeah, uh, sprawled out on a, a patio of a restaurant in Brooklyn with a cigar uh, clenched in between his teeth. And for people that don't know Sicilian, Lillo is Sicilian for cigar. His nickname was the cigar and he was a, <laughs> a diabolical, ruthless individual that oh, it was uh, awful. got really got killed by his own men, but it it was it was stemmed yeah. from his greed that was upsetting everybody in the New York underworld. Oh yeah, he he was set up by uh, Baldo Amato and uh, Cesare Bonaventri, who were his bodyguards. Yeah. They were zips that he brought over from Sicily uh, as his bodyguards, and uh, uh, they did him in, and as a reward for doing him in because he, he was set up by the other mafia families. In other words, the other mafia families gave the contract out. Yep. And as a reward, uh, they gave uh, Bonaventure uh, sole power as far as importing the heroin from Sicily. I gave him his own crew. I think he was 26 years old at the time. That's I all believe. he was, he was 26. The, and I believe he was the youngest capo at that time in yeah. New York City. And, and his his uh, assistant was Baldo Amato, who was his cousin. Yeah. And and these are the people I dealt with, you know, when when, when I dealt with the Laporters and Ficalora and uh, and Afadagato. These were all uh, Bonanno family under Cesare. And another person that we can kind of bring the story up until 2022, one of the conspirators in the Galante assassination was a young up and coming soldier at the time by the name of Bruno Indelicato. Um, and oh, yeah. Bruno Indelicato. Yeah. So when Bruno Indelicato just walked out of prison uh, a couple weeks ago and uh, he'd been locked up for about 20 years, um, he was another guy that uh, whose participation in that murder plot. Was able he was able to leverage that into status in the Bonanno crime family. His dad was Sonny Red, who eventually was murdered in a yeah a, in a triple homicide that was depicted in the movie Cas- uh, not Casino depicted in the movie Donnie Brasco. And actually, Bruno, there's a character of Bruno in Donnie Brasco. It's the actor yeah. that plays Mustang Sally from The Sopranos. I think his name is Brian Tarantino. He's yeah. been in a bunch of which, which isn't a. Although I love that movie, it's not a very flattering portrayal because a Bruno. He, he, yeah, because right. he, he was more gangster than right. they make Bruno out and Donnie <laughs> Brasco like to kind of be a lack of. Uh, <laughs> they make Bruno out to be a lackey of his dad, right. in the movie, but in reality, Bruno was quite capable. Yeah, yeah, right, exactly. But he was a crazy, coked out cowboy. Yeah, um, that Donnie Brasco got a contract for. That was how Donnie Brasco. A.K. Joe Pistone was going to make his bones. He was going to kill Bruno to yeah, kind of put, down a, in Florida. put an end. Right. And then they pull the, the bureau ends up pulling Pistone out um, of his undercover work. Bruno ends up getting indicted in the uh, in the in the commission case ends up going away for like 10, 11 years, comes out in the 90s and becomes a top capo and lieutenant of Vinnie Gorgeous, uh, Vinnie Basciano, who eventually becomes the boss of the Bonanno crime family. And then uh, Indelicato is indicted and found guilty of a murder that he did with Basciano. And that's what he's been doing the last 20 years. But he's not that old, even though he's spent probably about 30 years in prison. I believe he's sev- in his early 70s. So there's, yeah. there's, I'm, I'm, I'm interested to see where Bruno and Delicato get slotted in the modern day Bonanno crime family. Do you have any thoughts on that, Frank? No, I don't. I, I, I wouldn't know in the modern, uh, you know, I'm, 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 I'm sort of like a, a 
dated, you know. But does that blow your uh, mind that guys that you were working back oh, in yeah, the seventies yeah, or I know. I, guys I, are still I worked, active today? As they say, I, I worked on all these people. There were so many uh, uh, Italians that we worked on that you know really went up uh, and became bosses. Um, Which is another that, example of how the the drug you know, the, the entrance into the drug world are going kind of full board into the narcotics um, rackets, which a lot of these wise guys did in the 70s. It was kind of like something that wise guys did in the 40s, 50s, and 60s too, but not to the degree that they did in the 70s. And a lot, like you just said, a lot of these guys were able to leverage that reputation in the drug world into... 20 years down the road, becoming oh, bosses did. of these families. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And well, just uh, I'll give you an example. I, I, I was undercover into the Cherry Hill Gambinos, you know, uh, uh, Joseph John. Rosario. And, and it's my understanding that Joseph's son is now no, the Rosario. capital in Los Angeles. Rosario's son. Rosario's son, I'm sorry. Rosario's son. Tommy Gambino is alleged to be the boss of what's left of the L.A. Mafia. But Giuseppe's son was arrested in Italy. Yes, recently. recently. And he's a Gambino member. And that was like a year ago. Yes, Maybe. very recently. Yeah. Right, yeah. right. They had surveillance of him meeting with all the top Palermo guys on a boat. Right. And John somewhere. Gambino, who he's referencing, these were the... The Cherry Hill Gambinos were cousins of Carlo Gambino. Uh, they came from yeah. Sicily, set up shop. They, they, were the, they were the Sicilian faction of right. the Gambinos. Set up shop uh, in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, right across the uh, border from Philadelphia. Oh, and he, again, they had pizza shops. Right. And they had Zips working for them and distributing the heroin through the pizza shops. And I got involved with them because they had torched their one of their nightclubs, Valentino's. And they wanted me to, you know, in an undercover capacity to take it over. And I thought it was a good idea. But, of course, uh, uh, the government wouldn't go for it. I thought we'd set it up where we'd have cameras and we'd have uh, audio all over the place. Because at the time, after Valentino's was torched, all of us used to hang out at a, a club in Cherry Hill called Club Enchante. And that's where you had the Philadelphia people coming over and Nicky Scarfo coming up from uh, Atlantic City. And you had the Sicilians. And I figured, man, we could get all them into this nightclub and, and you know, uh, do some work on them. But uh, they wouldn't go for it. So, as I say, we were meeting at this place called Club Enchante. It was a private club. And uh, you had who's who in narcotics and organized crime hanging out there. You know, and we're talking about guys that you worked that eventually became bosses, uh, John Gambino, uh, oh, of, yeah. of the Cherry Hill Gambinos. He didn't become a sole boss, but in the late 2010s, he was on the ruling board of the Gambino crime family. He died a couple of years ago, and yeah. uh, John was actually caught on a tape in 2011 with the Philly guys, with Joe Legambi and those guys uh, discussing you know, my politics. Yeah. Well, this was awesome. Frank, uh, you are a superstar. You are always welcome back on the OG podcast. <laughs> well, it's, it's great talking to you guys. And uh, as I say, uh, uh, I, I try to remember everything that went down, you know, but we were very active on the black violators uh, during the seventies, uh, especially us in the task force, the New York Drug Enforcement Task Force, which was made up New York City cops, DEA agents, and New York State police. And uh, we were very effective, uh, effective in taking them down. Look who we took down, you know. Uh, we took down Barnes, Frank Lucas, uh, Goldfinger, and many and, of the others. Hey, hey and, Frank, and it, Barnes and Lucas both flipped. Yeah, well, uh, Lucas flipped. Well, Barnes uh, flipped too. Uh, Barnes uh, uh, flipped also, but Lucas was the one that knew everything. Bar or uh, Lucas flipped before Barnes. Go ahead. What do you, Frank? Yeah. What, what do you think happened to Frank Matthews? Oh yeah, we didn't. Oh, I I, I think he was murdered. Wow. Really? You do? You don't think he's on a beach somewhere in uh, Puerto Vallarta right now? No. You know, 
I when we were looking for Frank Matthews, it was my understanding that you, you had a, a lot of corrupt attorneys in New York. And it was my understanding that just before he was going to go to trial, one of these attorneys uh, said, look, uh, we made arrangements to get you to the Caribbean. Just bring what you have to bring, and we'll take our boat out and meet the other boat. And this, is, this, of course, was a rumor, mm -hmm. you know, but there might be some credibility to it. And then they killed him on the boat? Yeah, because I, I don't think he he would have disappeared, you know, forever. We would have come up with him. So let's give people that's a little... In, that's, that's pretty... Yeah, so people that don't breaking know, news. <laughs> Frank Matthews, a.k.a. Black Caesar, um, was one of these very prominent uh, African-American narcotics traffickers out of Harlem, but he was also... Out of Philadelphia, out of Baltimore, out of oh, yeah. uh, you know, he was someone that had a very wide reach, and he was about to go to trial in 1973, I believe, the summer of 73, yeah. and yeah. he took off, uh, and nobody's ever found him. And there's rumors no, about. And I, I, as I say, at the time when we were looking for him, uh, you know, there were rumors that uh, uh, some scam was played by these. Uh, uh, attorneys and he brought all his money with him and of course they they offed him out at sea well there's something that might give some credence to this pretty, as we're talking about pretty it interesting and tell me what you think about this because I, I just wrote something recently there was a pretty uh con contentious meeting or series of meetings between matthews and members of the genovese crime family in the months before Matthews disappeared. So yeah. this is actually kind of lending some merit to what uh, Frank Vanessa is saying that he heard. So they were doing a drug deal together in the spring of 73. Yeah. And some of these Genovese either didn't respect Frank or they didn't respect Frank Matthews or they knew he was going away. So they thought they could get away uh, with scamming him. Yeah, and they, they they try to scam him. Well, he fronted three hundred twenty-five thousand. Right, exactly, and they took the, okay. Right, and he's supposed to get so many kilos, and they stiffed him. So he went to the powers to be. We kidnapped a guy. Yeah, they kidnapped uh, uh, a guy one down of the in, mob guy. Right, and so uh, as ransom, he got back uh, the three hundred twenty-five thousand dollars plus to make amends. They, they fronted him 25 kilos of heroin. Right, but I'm thinking to myself, maybe the Genovese, or maybe that was just a ploy to get to get him to uh, lower his guard, and then what you're saying plays into a, a narrative that the Genovese had him killed. And got their money back. Uh, right. It's, it's very true. It's very wow. true. And they got, they uh, as I say, the rumor was that, uh, you know, he had a... a uh, a suitcase full of money and jewels and all that. And he believed these attorneys and I'm uh, for the life of me, I used to know the attorney's names and I can't think of them right now, but I'll, um, and, and I think that's what happened. You know, another guy that was very big black violator was Zach Robinson. Never heard of him. Never did. No, we had a, we had a story. We arrested him in the task force. So anyway, when we arrest him uh, uh, in his car, in the trunk is $325,000, okay? So he's in jail, and his sister comes to pick up the car. So one of the guys that worked for me, she says, I came here to get my brother's car. And they said, okay, you can have it. Was there anything else in the car? So the agent, you know, busting her horn says, no, there wasn't anything else. What do you mean there wasn't anything else? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, no, there wasn't. Don't tell me you took that three hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> this stupid ass broad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I see. I'm j just did a quick Google search. Yeah, he comes up a lot. Is connected all these guys that Frank's talking about. Uh, Frank Matthews and I'm um, surprised. I'm shocked. These other guys that Frank Matthews doesn't have a more of a pop culture profile. That you know, people they think Barnes, they think Lucas. Nobody. Unless you're someone that really studies this stuff, you don't know who Frank Matthews was. And he was bigger yeah. than Barnes and Lucas. 
you, you know who was another guy that I worked on heavily with my brother Andy was uh, James Lofton. Yeah, who don't get don't hit, don't don't get him confused with the NFL wide receiver. There was another oh, no, James no, no, Lofton no. that was this a drug that was a drug no. Buffalo Bills right and the Green Bay who Packers. had a real estate company. Uh, he lived in New Rochelle. And he was he was a heavy violator too, and connected with all of them, of course. Uh, Frank, did you have a difficult time uh, navigating through the potential corruption on the part of local PD? Because when we we think of the big heroin dealers in the seventies and early eighties, you know, we we've heard stories about elements within NYPD being corrupt. Was that difficult for federal law enforcement to navigate well, through that? Yeah, you, you know, there was always the thing about the French Connection heroin. And they blamed a number of people. And when Bob Lucy became, uh, who was a detective, became an informant, uh, he gave up the other detectives. Uh, he gave up uh, 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 a number of guys that worked in SIU. And so there was a lot of corruption going on. You know, uh, SIU was noted. You know, those were the days going back when you had, uh, uh, you know, the fr French Connection heroin and you had. They called them the Seven Ups. Uh, yeah, they made a movie about it with yeah. Roy Scheider. I was it's an underrated uh, '70s uh, cop flick. Yeah, yeah, and there was a lot of stories about them. But me personally, I was involved, in, and I didn't know until after the fact. I was doing undercover work for uh, NYPD too, you know, uh, and so the guy that was handling me was a detective by the name of Steve Caracapa, okay? Huh. And I, I I did some cases for him. I was doing it on Chinese people. And Steve Caracapa turned out to be an assassin for the mafia. Yeah, right. I knew Yeah, I knew that, recognized that yep. name right away. And wow. Was, and I didn't re did you know that Frank was working with him? No, I did not know you were working with him. This is another part of your, cops. your TV show. This right. is going to be a storyline right. in your, <laughs> your TV show. Yes, right. you know, I, I, not, I, as we say in New York, nothing for nothing. But I never trusted him. Wow, Caracapa. They were there killing was people. Nothing about they him. weren't just dirty cops. They were doing yeah. hits, right? Oh, they were hitting people, right? Oh yeah, for gas pipe and uh, and Vicamuso. Oh yeah. Well, Frank, this was great. You've done it all. You've seen it all. You've uh, you've you've literally you've you've lived a a epic novel and ten movie scripts and one day me and you are going to get your story to the big screen hopefully sooner than later we got some things in the hopper right now that uh, hopefully we can discuss maybe in a few months if this if these things go uh you know coalesce a little bit more but frank and i have been on that journey so. for a couple of years it's a roller coaster um but it, it, your story really deserves uh, for the public to be able to digest it because it's such an yeah. amazing story I, I call it donnie brasco on steroids <laughs> and uh, thank you so much, Frank. We're going to have you on okay. again. And uh, we we thank you. You are an OG's OG, and we salute you. Thank you. You guys take care. Thank Good you, Frank. talking to you. Bye. So, bye, bye, Frank. Bye. We're going to sign off. Uh, thank you for enjoying another edition of the Original Gangsters podcast. I'm Scott Bernstein for Jimmy Bucciolato and Ben Behind the Glass, who was a godsend since joining our team. Um, we are going to sign off and we will see you next week. Please uh, subscribe, like, share. We got more video content coming. It's going to be more consistent. Ben is a, just a superstar uh, editor and, and is really helping us move the needle here. We will see you next week. Scott Bernstein, Jimmy Bucciolato, OG podcast out. <laughs>